Thank you for that very kind introduction. And thank you for inviting me to deliver this year's Margaret Lawrence Lecture. I'm deeply honored and, and a bit daunted, really, by the privilege. Um, I want to thank, in particular, Professor Margaret Hobbs for her energy and effort in organizing my visit, and also uh, to the Women and Gender Studies Department and the members of the Trent University and Peterborough communities for welcoming me. And I'll thank Margaret Lawrence, uh, author, feminist, and it seems to me a, a writer who captured something about how we make and are made by our country, our land, our community. Those are themes that engage me again and again, albeit in a different way, and to which I turn now. The title of my presentation tonight is Unsettling Canada, The End of Immigration as Nation Building. And my topic departs from a conception of Canada as what I will call a country of immigration. So what does it mean to say that Canada is a country of immigration? Well, it might mean something different to each of us, so let me just explain how I use the term. I start from the proposition that most states of the world, certainly states of the global north, are countries of immigration in the empirical sense. That is, they receive significant numbers of migrants from other countries. But that's not really uh, how I'm using the term. Instead, I focus on what I call normative countries of immigration. And by this I mean countries that embrace and celebrate immigration as constitutive of the nation. This stands in contrast to countries that, although they, ex they might have significant uh, inward migration, they accept immigrants in order to plug holes in their labor market or to perform jobs that nationals will not do or at the limit to fulfill international obligations toward refugees. Numbers of immigration, of immigrants entering a country, don't tell the story about whether one is or is not what I call a normative country of immigration. Canada's foreign-born population hovers at about 20%, while the United Emirates has a foreign-born population of about 80%. Yet immigration is integral to Canada's self-understanding of what it means to be a country. While migrants are indispensable economically, yet politically invisible in the United Arab Emirates. There are many other examples I could choose. The countries of Europe provide an interesting example of states in transition. In the 19th century, countries of Western Europe and Eastern Europe uh, were countries of emigration that supplied the new world, like Canada, with immigrants. By the end of the 20th century, Many, if not all, were indisputable, indisputably countries of significant immigration in empirical terms. But they are only gradually and fitfully accepting that demographics, economics, political stability, all require them to graduate from mere toleration to an embrace of immigration. Now in normative terms then, Canada has been, over the course of its history, a country of immigration. And so from now on, when I use the term country of immigration, I mean a country of immigration in that normative sense. So too is the United States, Australia, New Zealand, many Latin American states, and perhaps more controversially, Israel. The others are not, or at least not clearly so. I want to make one more prefatory note before I move on. Now it so happens that the states I've dubbed countries of immigration also travel under the name settler societies. And if the label countries of immigration has a largely positive valence, well, the latter, settler societies, does not. Settler societies have been built on the physical and cultural dispossession of indigenous peoples. And the story of Canada as a nation of immigrants can only be recounted with pride, as it almost always is, if immigration is understood as a process of extending hospitality and membership by those entitled to do so as opposed to a practice of entrenching ongoing invasion and occupation. I find myself in agreement with the idea that regardless of when we, who are non-Aboriginal peoples, or our ancestors came here, we are all now treaty people. If our entitlement to be here rests on treaty, then our conduct must also be refracted through our responsibilities as a treaty partner. And so here I would just acknowledge that um, the Alderville, Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Skugog Nations are the treaty peoples of this particular region. 
Now, the argument that I wish to develop tonight proceeds from the claim that Canada was and remains a normative country of immigration. That is, a country that is significantly constituted through immigration, where immigration is understood as central to, rather than an external supplement to the project of nation building, of building and sustaining the nation. My thesis is that three features of Canada's historic approach to immigration and citizenship typify a normative country of immigration. Okay. These three features, I would suggest, have played similarly prominent roles in the history of other settler societies. Okay. But where I go from that, if I can satisfy you that Canada is a country of immigration, countries of immigration have these three features, the next claim I want to make is that over the past few years, Canada has been resiling from these policies and moving in a different direction, a direction more similar to those practiced by non-countries of immigration. I will review some of those policy shifts and then ask you to join me in speculating, or reflecting on what this shift means for our understanding of Canada in the present, what it means for the future, and what it means for our understandings of Canadian citizenship as well. So let me begin by listing then what I understand to be those three features that typify a country of immigration. Okay. The first is permanent immigration as opposed to temporary immigration. The second is a focus or uh, an acceptance of the family as a unit of migration. And the third is facilitated acquisition of citizenship. So let me begin with permanent immigration. A commitment to permanent immigration describes a shared expectation that those who are admitted to and settle in Canada will ultimately remain here more or less permanently and become full members of the nation. So I'm not talking here about tourists or sojourners or people who come to visit, but of people who come to work, to reunite with family members here, or to escape persecution. The expectation then is that when these people come, by and large, they will remain permanently. Since before Confederation, permanent, this model of permanent re relocation was the dominant mode of migration to Canada. And that's true even if many who came harbored the dream of someday returning to their home country. Okay. This general commitment to permanent migration was subject to two main qualifications. First, even those admitted permanently could lose that status and become removable under limited circumstances. And secondly, there have, all through Canadian history, been exception to, exceptions to the permanent admission of immigrants as workers. Some workers were only admitted temporarily on the expectation that they could be easily discarded and, re and expelled to their home country when their labor was no longer necessary. These people were not desired as members of the nation. The Chinese who built the railway and worked in the mines, the Caribbean women who came to care for Canadian children, these people, among many others, were admitted as workers but not as future members. In other words, Canada's policy of permanent immigration was subject to racist override. While their labor was wanted, they were not. Okay. From the 1960s onwards, Canada abandoned explicitly racist preferences in admissions and replaced it with a point system that, broadly speaking, uh, made admissions decisions based on human capital. And so people would be evaluated on the basis of their education, occupation, work experience, language ability, and so on. And if they earned enough points on this metric, then they would be admitted to Canada as skilled workers or economic immigrants, along with their families, and uh, granted permanent resident status. Throughout this period, Canada did continue to admit some workers on a temporary basis. The numbers were relative to the numbers admitted permanently, rather small, and they operated on a specific logic 
that people admitted as temporary workers were filling jobs for which there was a temporary need. A couple of persistent exceptions to these, which also happened to be racialized, were seasonal agricultural workers and live-in caregivers. As you might know, most live-in caregivers uh, came from the Caribbean and then later the Philippines. Their powerful and successful advocacy under the slogan, good enough to work, good enough to stay, eventually resulted in the reform of policy and opened up a channel to permanent residence for live-in caregivers as well. Now, the pattern I'm describing, the overwhelming pattern of admission as a permanent resident of Canada and subsequent enrollment on a path to citizenship, stands in contrast to the widespread reliance by other states, those countries of empirical immigration, on temporary workers, sometimes called guest workers. These workers were admitted to provide labor for which there was a permanent demand. Here, the admission of migrants as temporary worker was not driven by the fact that the demand for the labor was temporary, but rather expressed the desire that the individual worker's presence be temporary. She should not get too comfortable, she shouldn't settle, raise a family, or otherwise mistakenly come to think of herself as a member of the national community in which she lived, resided, and worked. A country that is not a normative country of immigration will be concerned to maintain the borders of that nation intact, even as they open the borders of the state and of the economy. And for these countries, immigration is not constitutive of the nation, but rather a threat to its integrity and must be carefully managed in order to extract maximum economic benefit without undermining the content and the identity of the nation. Guest workers may enter the state, but they remain outside the nation. Sooner or later, they're expected to go back where they came from. And this is expressed in a temporary dead-end status. Now, the human cost of this permanent temporariness is often exacted on migrants themselves, is always exacted on migrants themselves, but it's not limited to the migrants themselves because there is a cost to the democratic character of any country that has a large disenfranchised population working and living over many years and yet who are governed without a voice. This was poignantly captured by Swiss playwright Max Frisch many years ago who said of the Swiss guest worker program of the late 20th century, we asked for workers, we got people instead. Now, a corollary of Canada's historic policy of encouraging permanent immigration as distinct from what I've described as a guest worker regime, has been investment in settlement services, often delivered through non-governmental community organizations. Language training, employment assistance, and other services assist newcomers to integrate economically, socially, and culturally. And I had the good fortune to be sitting with some of those who work in that sector here in Peterborough over supper tonight. Now, I don't wish to underestimate the persistent and serious challenges that settlement services um, I'm sorry, serious challenges that confront the process of integration. And we all know the stories about the taxi driving doctors and the pizza delivering engineers and so on. But I only point out here that settlement services represent an investment in future citizens. If you aren't admitting people with the expectation that they will become members of your society, then the corresponding need for settlement services evaporates along with it. But all in all, Canada's historic policy of encouraging permanent immigration and providing settlement services advances the goal of building the nation by admitting and incorporating immigrants and later refugees on a permanent basis, by welcoming them and by encouraging them to think of themselves as new Canadians. The second feature of a normative country of immigration that I spoke of is the centrality of family as opposed to the individual as the relevant unit for immigration purposes. Some of you may have heard a classic quote by Clifford Sifton, who was the Minister of the Interior for Canada in 1906, when he described the ideal immigrant as, quote, a stalwart peasant in a sheepskin coat. Sifton was emphatic that he was, quote, indifferent as to whether he was British born, unquote, by which I think he really meant he didn't care which part of Europe they came from. But I want to draw your attention to the rest of the quote by Clifford Sifton, which is less often heard. A stalwart peasant born on the soil 
whose forefathers have been farmers for 10 generations with a stout wife and a half dozen children is good quality. Okay, give or take the stout part. Why a stout wife and six children? Because farming was a family operation. The success of the husband's labor depended on the social and physical reproductive labor of his wife and the contributions of the children. And while the family farm may seem anachronistic in the sense of being a true family business, the idea of the family as a primary economic, social, cultural, reproductive, and distributive unit makes a lot of sense, especially in the context of immigration. Building the nation in demographic and political terms means that people are admitted not only as workers, but as parents or future parents. If only the worker is admitted and the family members remain in another country, the likelihood of income being diverted into remittances increases, and so the profit of that labor isn't reinvested into the local economy. And money that would otherwise be spent in, by the family in Canada is redirected to support the family abroad. That's a kind of economic rationale for enabling family-based migration. Now, the encouragement of family migration is, of course, related to the promotion of permanent immigration. The chances that an adult immigrant will put down roots somewhere and remain in a country permanently, rather than move on to another country, often the US, or return home, improve if they are encouraged to bring their families to Canada. And indeed, history shows that disfavored groups who were desired as workers but not as people were admitted only as temporary workers and were barred by law or in practice from bringing family members. The Chinese indentured laborers who built the CPR an iconic nation-building enterprise, were known as bachelor husbands. It's because they weren't allowed to bring their families. Women admitted as live-in caregivers were, and are, prohibited from bringing family members for as long as their status remains temporary and tied to the task of caring for other people's children. Now, historically, Canada had a fairly broad definition of family, though the borders of family have shifted over the years. Fiancés were in, fiancés were out. Common law and same-sex partners are in. Siblings used to be in, then siblings were out. And the United States has a different model. They include siblings, for example, uh, but they differentiate between citizens and permanent residents for purposes of sponsoring family members. I'll return to this later. But the point I want to make here is just that Canada's relatively capacious welcome to families was predicated on what one might call the enlightened self-interest of a settler society. After all, attracting and retaining immigrants is easier if you roll out the welcome mat for their families. As a result, I would suggest, there was never a need in Canada to articulate family reunification as an entitlement flowing from any conception of justice or human rights. It was just good policy from a Canadian perspective, Canadian settler society perspective. Meanwhile, in late 20th century Europe, the story was different. From the 1950s to the 70s, Several states rebuilt their post-war economies on the backs of guest worker regimes. Most famously, German, Germany's reliance on Turkish guest workers is one of the most famous examples. And when the inevitable happened, and the so-called guest workers became de facto and eventually de jure permanent, okay, they mobilized to bring political pressure to bear on the German government to enable them to bring their wives and children to live in Germany as well. This battle for family reunification was mainly political and to some extent legal, but it was articulated expressly in terms of justice, fairness, and the value of family unity. In other words, the ability of long-term migrants to bring their families to live with them was articulated in the discourse of morality and human rights. And the European Convention on Human Rights specifically guarantees a right to family life, and while this provision has been interpreted narrowly in the immigration context, it has been successfully invoked to obstruct deportation of non-citizens where doing so would rupture significant family relationships. So why am I telling you all this detail? Well, the ironic outcome of this is that Canada, a country that has historically encouraged family migration, has never refracted that family-based migration through the lens of human rights while European states, precisely because they had to be dragged, kicking and screaming, to allow family reunification, have had to contend explicitly with the human rights dimension of family immigration. 
The third feature of countries of immigration that I want to turn to now is access to citizenship. So this is the final define, what I contend is the final defining feature of a country of immigration. And here I'm focusing on citizenship as legal status or nationality in international law and not on citizenship in the many other senses it is used both in popular discourse or in other academic disciplines. Okay. So thinking here now about legal citizenship, my claim is that settler societies promote acquisition of citizenship by immigrants via naturalization and that they generally enable citizenship to be easily uh, acquired at birth as well. Now let me acknowledge in talking about this that I am bracketing off the particular complexities of aboriginality and citizenship in a settler society context. So here, just to explain a little bit about citizenship acquisition, okay. So you can get to be a citizen in two ways, by being born into it or being so-called naturalized into it. You can be born into citizenship in two ways. One, by being born on the soil of the country, jus soli, law of soil. Or you can be born to a citizen of the country, use sanguinis, law of blood. So you get to be a Canadian citizen either by being born on Canadian soil or being born to a Canadian citizen. Okay. Citizenship acquisition by naturalization. Okay. There are usually in Canada and elsewhere various criteria by which somebody who is a permanent resident of Canada can then apply for and become a Canadian citizen. First requirement is residence over some defined period of time. Now, as you might know, Canada, the Canadian government has just introduced a new citizenship bill that proposes to change the minimum residency period in Canada from three out of the last five years to four out of the last six years. Okay? That's an example of a residence requirement. Typically, one must show some level of language proficiency in the official language or languages, as the case may be and a knowledge of history, politics, and culture of, of the country. These are features of Canadian naturalization policy. They are features of, Canadian, of naturalization law in many, many other countries. Okay. Now, um, as I said, Canada offers birthright citizenship by descent and by birth on territory. Virtually every state in the world conveys citizenship by descent, but you soli, citizenship by birth on Canadian soil, is more rare. It originated in 17th century British law in a famous judgment called Calvin's case, in which an English court held that a person born in the territory of the sovereign owed allegiance to that sovereign, whatever the origin of his or her parents and whatever sovereign might have governed that territory in the past. So use soli originated for particular reasons of exercising kind of control of sovereigns in, um, in Europe. In post-revolutionary France, where all male citizens were potential conscripts, Jus Soli also ensured that children born in France to foreigners didn't have the advantage of, avo of avoiding conscription. But as the 19th and 20th centuries progressed, Jus Soli became associated with settler societies, the new world countries of immigration, while Jus Sanguinis remained the sole mechanism of birthright citizenship in old world European countries of immigration. The political rationale behind this transition is not too mysterious. Countries of emigration, countries that send people out, as it were, do not want necessarily to sever the links that bind the emigre to the country of origin. They want to maintain a connection with their diaspora, and allowing citizenship to be transmitted by descent means that, for example, the children of Italian immigrants to Canada will continue to be Italian. And hopefully maintain connections to Italy and possibly do business in Italy and possibly return to Italy and so on and so forth. Settler societies, on the other hand, are preoccupied with the task of creating a, a political community from scratch, so to speak. They need people who feel bound to their new country in which they live and they want people to feel a stake in the future of that country. Use soli, automatic citizenship to children born on the soil of the country, encourages children to grow up understanding themselves as always already members of the nation. It also encourages prospective immigrants to invest in a country, secure in the knowledge that their future children will be automatic, full, and equal citizens in the new land. 
Use cell law is also easy and cheap to administer, since birth on territory is simple to ascertain and avoids the bureaucratic expense, complexity, and potential arbitrariness involved in operating a pure use sanguinous regime that, recall, that calls on difficult bureaucratic exercises to prove what citizenship one parent, one's parent has. Among other things, a regime that only grants citizenship by descent must eventually compel each person to carry a mas some kind of mandatory national identity document to prove their citizenship status. Now, countries of immigration also make naturalization relatively easy for permanent immigrants. Typical naturalization criteria across all states include what I've described above, residence, language proficiency, knowledge, etc. But each of these criteria can be made more or less stringent. Residence requirements can be as little as three years as they are in Canada, though that may change soon, or as many as 30 as they are in Switzerland or Austria. Language fluency benchmarks can range from basic to advanced and can be assessed with varying degrees of flexibility and accommodation. Citizenship exams can demand memorization of more or fewer facts that are more or less arcane. No state dispenses entirely with any of these requirements, although they may make exceptions. For example, they may forego the language testing or other requirements for elderly or mentally challenged individuals, or they may expedite the naturalization of elite athletes who fail the residency requirements in order to enable them to compete in the Olympics. This is a favorite thing for countries to do, right? <laughs> what I want to suggest here, though, is that a country's choice to make citizenship easier or harder to attain through naturalization depends on whether one regards citizenship or the state regards citizenship as a tool of integration or a reward for integration. If citizenship is understood as a tool of integration, then one would expect the criteria to be more relaxed. The idea would be that integration is a complicated, highly variable, and personal process that extends across one's lifetime. And I think anyone who has emigrated from one country to another will know that. By conferring citizenship, a state recognizes that the individual has demonstrated some kind of baseline commitment to the country, and that the rights flowing from legal citizenship, the franchise, the right to enter and remain for which a passport is necessary, the ability to serve in the military, to have full access to government employment, can further motivate the individual to deepen the experience of membership through participation. On this model of citizenship as tool of integration, citizenship is not the terminal point, but rather a recognition of significant past commitment and an encouragement of an even more extensive future engagement. As uh, May Nye recently remarked about the historic stance of the United States toward um, citizenship, access to citizenship is the best way to promote social and economic integration, democratic participation, and political equality. And here I think you get this sense of citizenship as tool. Okay? Countries of immigration historically want people to become citizens. They want as many people to become citizens as are eligible. To the extent that settler societies want to establish democratic credentials and political community, it makes sense to encourage naturalization on generous terms. And as I mentioned earlier, it corrodes the democratic character of a, of a nation if a significant segment of the population remains on the margins of that polity, disenfranchised and voiceless. Conversely, countries that view immigration as diminishing rather than enhancing the nation feel rather less motivated to expand legal membership in that polity. From this perspective, naturalization bears the character of a unidirectional benefit. The state confers citizenship on a deserving candidate as a matter of duty or benevolence, but gets little in return. The state is doing a favor by naturalizing the long-term resident, and in this sense, citizenship becomes a reward upon demonstration of worthiness. If naturalization is understood as a reward, then the stakes are also considerably higher because the message it is meant to convey is that the person has climbed to the top of the membership hierarchy and arrived at the end point. No further integration necessary. Rewards by their nature are meant to be scarce and difficult to get in order to motivate people to attain them. So to recap, normative countries of immigration, on my hypothesis, are characterized by a preference for permanent over temporary immigration. 
They encourage family migration for nation-building purposes and promote access to citizenship. Countries of empirical immigration, but who do not embrace immigration as a nation-building exercise, exhibit a preference for regimes of temporary rather than permanent migration, admit family members as a matter of moral and political duty, and have relatively restrictive citizenship policies. Now, according to each of these metrics, Canada has been an exemplar of a country of immigration. I want to argue now that this is shifting. I emphasize it is shifting, but not in the empirical sense. I'm confident that Canada will continue to receive large numbers of migrants one way or another, and one way or another, many will remain permanently and eventually become citizens. But if current trends continue, I predict that Canada will drift away from the endorsement of immigration as a nation-building exercise, as constitutive of who we are in an ongoing iterative, iterative process, and instead move toward a notion of immigration as an economy propping crutch, a posture that more closely resembles the ambivalence and indeed condescension of old world European states over the 20th century toward immigration. So here's the evidence that I'm going to use to make the pitch. Okay. How is Canada resiling from a model of permanent immigration? Well, since 2002, the number of people admitted to Canada as temporary foreign workers has been creeping upward. And by 2008, for the first time ever, the number of people admitted as workers on a temporary basis admitted, uh, sorry, admitted on a temporary basis surpassed the number admitted as permanent residents. This pattern continues unabated. And this is a remarkable change. Two policy shifts explain the switch from permanent to temporary. First, with a few exceptions that I described earlier, the logic of a temporary migration program in Canada was that people are admitted on a temporary basis because the need for whatever specialized labor they provide is temporary. Beginning in 2002, the logic changed. Canada dramatically expanded the admission of temporary workers to fill chronic needs in the labor market where Canadians and permanent residents simply would not do the jobs at the wages and working conditions that employers wanted to offer. So instead of filling temporary needs, temporary workers now, now fill permanent or at least indeterminate uh, needs for jobs that are typically low in pay and are deemed as low skill that Canadians and permanent residents won't do. Now, across states and across time, an industry populated by foreign workers whose immigration status is precarious and dependent on pleasing employers always and inevitably creates a vulnerable labor force and conditions ripe for exploitation of that labor force. That story is the same story over and over again, wherever it happens and whenever it happens. Secondly, a second factor explaining the switch from permanent to temporary. As I mentioned earlier, Canada used to select so-called economic immigrants, people selected on the basis of their projected labor force participation contribution, according to a point system that, roughly speaking, measured human capital. Some of those applicants also had arranged jobs in Canada for which they would receive additional points, but most did not. In either case, their applications were evaluated by government officials employed by citizenship and immigration, and if accepted, they were admitted as permanent residents. Canada's human capital point system rightly or wrongly, was considered a model and attracted praise and emulation around the world. For the past several years, the government has been dismantling that point system, and it is virtually dead today, at least as it used to exist. Today, we have a patchwork of programs and schemes operating at the provincial and the federal levels. And while there's variation in how they operate, and they often change, and I have a lot of trouble keeping up with them, two features stand out. One is that much decision-making has been privatized, such that employers 
have increased authority to determine who comes to Canada. The other is that those workers who would have been admitted in the past as permanent residents under the old point system now instead go through a two-step process in which they spend a couple of years as a temporary foreign worker working for a particular employer, and then they apply to transition to permanent resident status. So from one step, admission as a permanent resident, to two steps, admission as a temporary foreign worker, followed by possible transition to permanent resident status. The upshot of this is that Canada is moving away from a regime of permanent migration of those selected as workers and toward a guest worker system. In this new world, some guest workers, those classified as high skill, will have a pathway to permanent residence, but the rest will not have access to this two-step process and will instead be permanently temporary. By Canadian law, they will be expected to leave after four years and prohibited from returning for another four years, no matter how good they are at their jobs, no matter how much they want to stay, and no matter how integrated they are into their workplace and community. This rule, the four-year-in, four-year-out rule, went into effect in April 2011. Now, the lesson learned from every other guest worker regime in every other liberal democracy is this. An arbitrary rule forcing people to leave will fail. It will inevitably fail. It has always failed. It will fail again. Some people will leave, but others will stay and continue working without authorization. Some of them will be specifically asked to stay by their employers. Some employers will continue to work them, employ them. Others will not, and they will go underground and find other employers who will. But all of this is to say that in a four-year-in, four-year-out rule, it means that some temporary foreign workers will come home from work and go to bed one night as workers and wake up the next morning, do the same thing, and be illegal immigrants. So what we have then is a policy that is primed to begin manufacturing illegality on April 1st, 2015. So look out, you know, the newspapers, you'll wake up in the morning and there'll be thousands and thousands of illegals in Canada. And you'll think, how did they all get here? Did they sneak across the border? Was there a boat that landed that I didn't hear of? No. It will be because there is this rule that says after four years as a temporary foreign worker, you must leave. And it is absolutely predictable and inevitable that many will not. It is so predictable and inevitable indeed that one is forced to ask whether it is the intention of the government to create a population of so-called non-status or illegal workers. Why would you want to do that? I'm not sure, um, and I'd be happy to speculate on that in, in question period, but I'll just leave that uh, for the moment. So, from a regime of permanent immigration and secure status for those whose labor is considered in demand, we are transitioning to a regime of temporary and precarious migration. The implications of this for settlement services, I think, um, are this. It is now the rule, if you will, that the settlement services that are made available uh, by Citizenship and Immigration Canada are only made available to those with permanent resident status. They are not available to those who don't have any legal status or those whose status is temporary. After all, if you don't have any legal status, you shouldn't be here at all. And if your status is temporary, we don't want you to stay. So why would the state invest any settlement services in those people? Okay. Now, I'll turn now to the second feature that I identified of a country of immigration, the family migration. What's happening here? Well, obviously, if you transition from a system of permanent immigration to temporary or two-step migration, there will be a direct effect on family unity. When a prospective immigrant is selected from abroad for permanent migration, under the point system or whatever, then that person, the called the principal applicant, can bring his or her immediate family along and embark on the settlement and integration process as a family. But when a person is admitted on a temporary visa, the conditions attached to it often make it legal, legally, or practically impossible for family members to join, especially if the temporary worker is designated as so-called low skill. And you can imagine that even if it is hypothetically possible to bring family members, if your own status is precarious, you might be reluctant to relocate your family uh, until your own status is secure. So instead what you get is the, you know, the so-called transnational family, 
that is maintained through the flow of remittances and sophisticated communications technology. So precarious immigration status, temporary status, prolongs family separation and places enormous strain on the nurturing, supportive, and educative functions of family. You know, those family values we talk about. Even if families are eventually reunited where the temporary worker is able to transition to permanent status, the settlement and integration experience of a family that has been ruptured in this way is often delayed or adversely affected as these families struggle to reconstitute themselves amid the pressures of adapting to a very new environment. So apart from this effect of temporariness on family unity, the government has recently sought to constrict family migration more directly. This has been accompanied or preceded by shifts in public discourse um, that have repeated and transmitted increasingly negative representations of family members who happen to be immigrants. So we hear about marriage fraud, for example, the phenomenon whereby Canadians sponsor non-citizens as spouses only to be abandoned shortly, af shortly thereafter by you know, the, the cunning um, fraudster who has used the Canadian or permanent resident in order to get immigration status and then basically dumped them as soon as they get off the plane. Parents and grandparents who are sponsored by adult children, often to provide crucial childcare support to working parents, have been derided as economically useless and drains on the healthcare system. The government has also moved somewhat more quietly, but still effectively, to cast aspersions on the inclusion of adult children in the family class. Right, well, up until recently, a dependent child was one who was up to the age of 22 or in full-time school. And these children have been denigrated on the basis that they are not or ought not to be dependents of their parents any longer. Now, it's striking that a government that presents itself as supportive of family values would simultaneously deprecate uh, the spouses, parents, and children who happen to be immigrants. But that seems to be something happening in the public discourse. So each of the family members I've named, who used to be members of the family class, spouses, parents, and grandparents, and children over 18, have been the subject of restrictive policy changes that deny them entry or make their presence in Canada insecure, precarious. Okay? So, as of about a year ago, a spouse who joins a husband, wife, or common-law partner in Canada will no longer receive permanent resident status upon entry. Instead, that spouse or partner will receive a two-year conditional status, which will only become permanent upon demonstration of cohabitation for two years. Now, during that two-year period, the sponsored spouse is subject to the state's surveillance. And if either spouse ends the relationship, the sponsored spouse becomes deportable. This, as I said, is meant to discourage or deter cunning foreigners from duping innocent Canadians with professions of true love and then dumping them, uh, the Canadian sponsor, as soon as they arrive in Canada with permanent resident status. I don't want to deny here that so-called marriage fraud or marriages of convenience occur in Canada as they do elsewhere. Um, and I would just point out that the phenomenon, these marriages of convenience, uh, include not only ones where there is a duped spouse in Canada, but also, and perhaps more often, collusion between willing partners as a favor or an exchange for money. Canadian law has always had the power to go after these relationships of convenience. But it never really did so with any zeal, probably because it's expensive, time-consuming. It's, a, in effect, not a great use of public resources when there are more serious issues to contend with. But this idea of conditional status, this two-year limbo, that has now been introduced in Canada has been around for a long time in European states and in the United States as well. But apparently, it doesn't work, since these countries continue to complain about ever-escalating rates of marriage fraud anyway. 
And presumably, a deceitful foreign spouse can just continue the deception over two years, instead of dumping their partner at the border, as it were, as can a colluding couple. But what conditional status does, however, is give a sponsoring spouse the power to threaten or actually trigger the deportation of a sponsored spouse. And where that Canadian spouse or partner is not a dupe, but an abuser, the threat of deportation becomes another weapon in the abuser's arsenal. Because a sponsored spouse who leaves an abusive relationship risks deportation at the hands of that vengeful spouse who can report her to immigration enforcement as a marriage fraudster. Now this is, as I think you can see, a highly gendered phenomenon, right? Um, and it is more often than not women who are going to be at risk in this way. Nevertheless, the Canadian government has decided that symbolically protecting duped Canadian spouses via conditional status is more important than actually protecting vulnerable immigrant women from being abused. What's happening now with parents and grandparents? Well, you might know about this. This has, again, been highly publicized. So parents and grandparents may, in law, still be sponsored as permanent residents of Canada. But now, uh, the children who sponsor them have to prove uh, significant wealth. They have to show that their income is significantly higher than it was in the past. This might lead one to wonder whether those are the people who actually need the presence of the parents and grandparents the most. Okay. The government has imposed a quota on the number of applications for permanent resident status of parents and grandparents that will be accepted per year. Uh, and the quota for 2014 was filled on uh, January 31st, 2014. The other route for parents and grandparents to reunite with adult children in Canada is the newly created temporary super visa, which is a two-year visitor visa renewable for up to 10 years. Super visa holders, unlike permanent residents, are ineligible for health coverage at public expense. So a prerequisite for obtaining a super visa is acquisition up front of private health care insurance for each parent. Okay. As you might imagine, that can be a quite expensive proposition. Okay. Now, several months ago, the government also reduced the maximum age of dependent children from 22 to 18. Dependent children is the category of children who may enter as members of the family class. So this means now that children over 18 are no longer considered family for purposes of immigration law. They cannot accompany parents who immigrate, and parents cannot sponsor them from abroad to reunite with them. The stated rationale for this is that 18 is the age of majority, and children over that age shouldn't be regarded as dependents who are integral to the family unit. They ought to be getting on with their lives being independent. Now, this is an interesting hypothesis, um, but in 2011, as some of you might know, almost 60% of Canadians between ages of 20 and 24 live at home with parents. And yet, in immigration law, if you're over 18, you damn well ought to be independent. Now, in justifying the policy change, the government did explain that children over 18 could still apply to enter Canada as foreign students, rather than as children of their immigrant parents. So the subtext is that families who really want their over 18 children to come should enroll them in Canadian University to ensure that child's admission to Canada. And if the child isn't able or willing to attend a Canadian University in one or other of the official languages, well, then Canada probably doesn't want that kid anyway. But what you also need to know about this alternative of entering as a foreign student rather than as uh, a sponsored member of the family class is this. Foreign student status is temporary, not permanent. Some foreign students may be able to transition to permanent resident status, a kind of two-step migration, but it's not assured. Foreign students can also be charged triple the tuition fees of Canadians and permanent residents. So if you imagine an immigrant family contemplating whether they can bring their child with them, and the option is, well, sure, you know, get that child enrolled in a Canadian university 
at triple the tuition fee while you are busy establishing yourself, then go ahead. So rather than encouraging the immigration of intact families to bolster the economic, social, and psychological integration of immigrants and to build the nation, current policy appears to be disaggregating the family into individuals, measuring each family member against a me metric of desirability or rent potential, and evaluating them accordingly. The outcome then is that fewer people count as family today than they used to, and even if they do count as family, in some cases, their presence is made precarious. Their status is conditional, as in the case of spouses, or temporary, as in the case of parents and grandparents or foreign students. So I'm going to turn now, last couple of minutes, last few minutes, to talking about what's happening with citizenship. And here, <laughs> well, there's a lot happening in citizenship. There's a new citizenship bill uh, introduced today. And, and rather than try to review what's in it, I'd be happy to talk about it in the question and answer period. But now I'm just going to give you a very brief snapshot of general trends. So I mentioned earlier that countries of immigration tend to see citizenship as a tool of integration, whereas countries of empirical but not normative countries of immigration instead use it as a reward for completion of integration. Now, since 2009, we've witnessed a series of legislative and policy changes to Canadian immigration that are generally designed to make citizenship harder to acquire and easier to lose. In 2009, the ability of Canadians to transmit citizenship by descent was restricted to the first generation born abroad. So, this use sanguinis that I talk about, it used to be available for two generations, now it's only available for one. Um, the government encouraged the public to link this legal reform to objections raised to the evacuation of Lebanese Canadian dual citizens from Lebanon in 2006. But the connection between those two is entirely spurious. There's absolutely no evidence that any of the Canadians evacuated were citizens by descent in any event. Indeed, there seemed to be no problem that this reform solved. All it did was reduce the number of future Canadian citizens. In 2011, the government declared that it was cracking down on the rampant problem of citizenship fraud. It introduced new and costly measures to investigate whether people had obtained Canadian citizenship without fulfilling the residency requirements or were in the process of applying for citizenship under false pretenses. And again, as with so-called marriage fraud, I don't want to deny that this phenomenon happens. That's not, that's not the, sort of the argument <laughs> that I'm, I'm uh, inclining toward here. I'm just trying to uh, track what the government says and then what has happened. So in early 2012, the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration boasted that his department was poised to strip citizenship from over 3,000 people on account of fraud and was investigating another 11,000 files. This sounds like a pretty serious problem and the government is, is on top of it. <laughs> After 18 months of gathering evidence, Citizenship and Immigration Canada was able to issue revocation notice, citizenship revocation notices in fewer than 300 cases. And over 90% of those cases are being disputed in, by, those, by the targets of the revocation in court. In total, 12 uncontested citizenship revocations arising from that initial investigation that purported to identify 3,000 citizenship frauds is what the result has been. And I don't know, you know, up until recently there were about, I don't know, hundred, there are hundreds of thousands of people who obtain citizenship every year. Okay, so this is a, um, an investigation that went over a period of several years and in the end generated 12 <laughs> citizenship revocations. And while the new Get Tough on Citizenship applicants produced few results in terms of citizenship stripping, the number of completed citizenship applications, that is applications that proceeded to citizenship in a given year, dropped by half presumably because bureaucratic resources were being allocated in the direction of investigation, surveillance, and policing, and not to processing and actually um, issuing citizenship to those who were qualified. 
We now have a backlog of 320,000 citizenship applications. The bureaucratic delay between applying for citizenship and obtaining a decision and proceeding to swear one citizenship oath and obtain a citizenship certificate has ballooned from a few months to two to three years. So without formally changing the minimum period of residence required for citizenship in Canada, in fact, we are already in a place where the residence requirement is no longer really three years, but more like five or six years. In the meantime, language requirements have been made more stringent and in part by removing any discretion on the part of the citizen, in, on the part of a citizenship judge to assess language ability in person. The citizenship test itself has been made more demanding and more people fail. The inflexibility of these new changes um, are reported to have had a disproportionate effect on those who enter Canada as refugees and on women who come as sponsored spouses, particularly uh, from certain parts of the world. So citizenship is indeed getting harder to receive, you know, harder to acquire, and there's a higher failure rate, and more and more of the people who are failing or not receiving citizenship are refugees and sponsored spouses. The government has just introduced a new citizenship bill, and it aims to do several things. As I mentioned to you, one of the things it will do is expand the residence requirement from three to four years, and that, of course, doesn't include the time for processing. Okay. Um, it will also uh, attempt to uh, resolve the citizenship imbroglio of the so-called lost Canadians, something I can talk about in the question period if you like. And it's also meant to clarify that when the law says you must be a resident in Canada for X number of years, you must, that means you must be physically present in Canada for that time. Okay. Apparent, however, the aspect of the law that I'd like to just mention to you is that the new citizenship bill will also revive the ancient punishment of banishment by introducing a provision that empowers the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration to strip citizenship from those who, in the Minister's opinion, don't deserve to be citizens anymore. And there are a list of criminal offenses which, under this new law, uh, would be offenses that entitled the Minister to, at his discretion, in effect, on a whim, um, to take away citizenship from somebody. This was first attempted in a private member's bill last year, and it died when Parliament rose for the summer, but it's now reintroduced as a government bill. The government has also hinted that at some future date, it plans to curtail or eliminate use soli citizenship, by which babies born on Canadian soil are automatically Canadian citizens. And I encourage you to keep an eye on the news in the coming months and to look up, you know, to um, take a moment if you happen to see a sudden and unaccountable rash of media reports about pregnant women who come to Canada to give birth to Canadian babies, the so-called anchor baby phenomenon or passport baby phenomenon, a practice of, that, of such unspecified yet grave proportions that it demands eliminating use soli citizenship. Okay? Because it's coming, I'm sure it's coming down the pike, right? There will be reports of these women who fly in from some country Seven, you know, nine months pregnant, have their baby just so the baby's born on Canadian soil, and then leave again, possibly without paying their hospital bills, and go back to their countries of origin, and this is a scourge on the nation, and it cheapens and devalues Canadian citizenship, thereby demanding a response, which is to eliminate use soli citizenship. Okay? That's the narrative that I think uh, one can expect to hear. But I'd like to be wrong about that. But, um, it's important to recognize that for all of us who are born in Canada, and that's tens and tens and millions, of, tens of millions of us, we have relied on our birth certificates that document the location of our birth on this land to prove that we are citizens. Many of us may also have parents who are citizens of Canada when we were born, but frankly, how many of us have ever looked for our parents' citizenship documents? How many of us have ever relied on those or needed to rely on them? We understand ourselves and the system understands us as Canadian citizens based on being able to show up with a birth certificate and say, I'm a Canadian citizen and now may I have my passport, please. So if the government proceeds as predicted, that simple, cheap and virtually problem-free tradition of use soli citizenship will end with us. So a couple words in conclusion. Over the past hour or so, I've contended 
that Canada has historically understood immigration to be intrinsic to an ongoing nation-building project. I've suggested that a tradition of permanent immigration, family unity, and citizenship promotion are the policy manifestations of this conception of Canada as a normative country of immigration. I argue that current policies are heading in a different direction and toward those countries that understand their relationship to immigration differently. I have not attempted to provide an account for why this is happening or why this is happening now. Nor have I embarked on an inquiry into what is at stake if Canadians cease to conceive of this country or if Canada simply ceases conducting itself as a normative country of immigration. These are not questions for me to answer, but rather an invitation to you to join in a dialogue. Thank you for listening to me.